Thank you, Hannah. So, I, I, I think we can still get out by noon. But if we don't, I think Roadhouse will keep the grill on till we get there. All right? No, they will not. Unless we tell them to. Uh, many of you have been asking me about our, our past week uh, when we went to Kentucky. And uh, I think uh, Josh and Dave and Joe and Brian and Josiah for going down and making that happen. Bless the Lord. So, Kim, did they tell you we have pictures? I want to show them what happened in Kentucky. This is their uh, coffee shop right here. You see Dave, he's, he likes coffee. Uh, <clears throat> this is the corner where they had their little sound booth, and they needed a nursery more than they needed a sound booth. So uh, we got in there, and we put some walls up, and then we uh, put some drywall on it, and then we put some mud on it, and then we put some carpet down, and then we took pictures of it again, and then, uh, amen, and then uh, April's going to have two babies. We collected almost double the amount of money that was needed to get that done for them. And they're... <laughs> Their ladies are going to come in this week and paint and finish up the carpeting around the edges, and they're going to see God move. They said a lot of the families that have visited their services didn't come back because they had little children, and it was hard in that little echoey coffee shop room for them to worship and, and enjoy it without being distracted. So now we have a soundproof nursery. For them. Praise God. Now, there are more of you that didn't get to participate in that than did. And I want to make it known that we have another opportunity for you to be blessed. Stand up, Adrian. We have Pastor Adrian from Indiana River here with us today. And his whole family. And the kids are in class, and Ruth is getting them in class. <clears throat> and they have put the roof on their church building, the Glory Barn, and they are ready to pour the concrete. And he said he believes they can put a concrete floor in their church uh, sanctuary for around $10,000. And I said, we got this. Amen? Amen. And he's the God of enough, the God of more than enough, the God of abundance, the God of supply. And so I think we can take care of that, don't you guys? Amen. Amen. So just mark your envelope, Indiana, and whatever amount the Lord puts on your heart to give, a dollar, a thousand, or the whole 10,000, just mark it on the envelope. Whatever God puts on your heart to help with this project, and don't miss out being a part. A small part is still a part. Right? Amen? And you spell that A-P-A-R-T. Just so you know. Most people spell it A-P-A-R-T, but that's wrong. I don't want any of you to be a part. I want you to be a part of Indiana River. I love that. I couldn't resist that. <clears throat> we need warehouse space because God has given us more than we have room to store right now. We are picking up trailer loads, truck, I'm talking about semi-trailer loads of 
stuff that's being donated for our new building. All kinds of furnishing, lights, tables, shelves, carts, all kinds of awesome stuff. It happened eight years ago when we built this building. All this stuff on the walls was donated, and we still have enough to add on and do the whole thing from that. And God is abundantly supplying again. So if you have a big old warehouse or a barn that doesn't leak and you would like for us to occupy uh, six or 800 square feet of that, we might just take you up on it because we're, we're really struggling with our pole barn. Right, Jim? <clears throat> so I thought I'd throw that out there. So let Jim know. Jim's the guy back there in the pink shirt. I don't know. Is that pink? Red? <clears throat> It was red until he went out in the sun. Oh, that's good. Okay, so our new building, everybody say new building. We're going to finish the second story out front here. It's going to look so different. We're going to put a new foyer on out here and a whole big corridor around this building. We're going to knock this wall out and go 55 feet farther that way and seat twice as many of us. So you don't have to crowd up down here to pray and you don't have to step over people and hunt for a seat or sit on a folding chair. Amen. So our, our uh, theme is going to be all in, all together, finishing the work. So we'll have uh, things for you to look at coming up, but we're in our third day of praying into this Prayer works. It's all, I mean, it's already way working, but we're not going to let up on the praying part. Praying about how we can be a part of this, how we can get more connected, how we can do more, serve more, give more, love more as we progress into this next phase and season of our church. So we will be giving you more specific numbers. We'll be giving you more specific pictures. Do you have that picture? Did you already put it up there? That's kind of what it'll look like from the parking lot over here looking this way. You'll get that view. There's the old barn on the right, the connector, and uh, that might be Tim and Ginger right there. <laughs> and that's Timmy Harris up on the top with the baby in one arm and a baby in his beside him. Two Tims coming to church. <laughs> so I want to continue a little bit of teaching today. Are you ready? Got your Bible? Are you ready to hear a little bit of the word of the Lord? The Bible is our only foundation here at the river. We don't speak from any other creed or document or uh, company information. We, we don't get our Bible studies sent to us from headquarters. We just seek the Lord and read the Bible. And if it says it, we will try our best to believe it. And if we don't understand it, the Holy Spirit will lead and guide us into all truth. And, and I'm a pastor, but I don't understand all of it. I'm not a pastor because I know all of the Bible. I'm not a pastor because I have all of the answers yet. But I'm working on it, and I want to, and I'm hungry for more. And I just say, God, give me some more so I can feed your people more of what you have for us in this time. And we've been talking about foundations. And foundations in a building look simple. They look like just, you know, gray old concrete. I mean, not many people decorate with concrete, you know, especially not indoors. You may have some concrete stuff out in your, you know, bird feeder or something like that, but they're not really that pretty. They're just a bird feeder, a bird bath, those kind of things. But inside, we, we get other materials involved, materials that have some color and some flair. But really, a foundation's not really that simple. And it's really, really, really Really, really, really important. And, and the size of the steel and the mixture of the concrete. You know, you can get concrete that won't hold hardly anything. And you can get concrete that will hold almost anything. 
some really strong stuff that you, you know, cost a lot of money for that really, really, really strong stuff. And if you don't get the right mixture, your foundation will crack. Doug knows about this stuff. And that mortar, you mix that mortar, you mix it too dry and the block sucks all the water out of it. Ten years from now, your blocks will be sticking out somewhere else. They won't be where you put them, right? Something like that. I don't know what I'm talking about. but <laughs> <laughs> If you lay stone, Todd, you, you want to wet it so it don't suck all the, mud, the water out of your mud and it'll last longer. That's what they say. I don't lay stone, but that's what they say. What we're building on is going to last, and we're going to talk about foundations, even though it's not flowery, colorful, and pretty. But this is a foundation in Hebrews chapter 6, where he tells us to go on to perfection, not laying again the foundations, but he lists these six things that says to me, this is foundational. And today we're, we've moved on into the one, uh, it's the fourth one in the lineup, and it's called the laying on of hands. It doesn't sound foundational. It doesn't excite academia. Matter of fact, seminaries almost gloss right over it. I haven't been to many, but... From what I read and what I hear, it's not something that they do a lot of dealing with. And many, many, many churches don't even practice laying on of hands at all. Well, let me tell you something. Five out of six foundations ain't going to do. You need to come on and get with the program. You'll never reach perfection until you get at least the six foundations to begin with. Amen? So we're going to talk about it. I'm not ashamed to talk about it. Amen. I'm not afraid people are going to leave if I talk about laying on of hands. So I don't want nobody laying hands on me. Okay. We're not going to run up and smear you with anything. <laughs> Nobody's going to smack you. We're gentle. We're nice. Amen. But we're going to tell you what the Bible says. Right. It's our only source of truth. A lot of folks build doctrine on their experience. How many of you ever had somebody lay hands on you and you received something from the Lord through the laying on of hands? Raise your hand. I want to see where we are here. We got, we got a good crowd. You got a touch from the Lord by the laying on of hands. Amen. Well, you can't build doctrine on your experience. You can't build a doctrine on feelings. He said, boy, when he laid his hand on me, I felt something. I believe that. But you can't build three tabernacles because you felt something. You can't hitch your wagon to somebody because you felt something when they touched you. That's not how we build doctrine. That's not foundational. To Your experience is not foundational. It's laid on a foundation. The word of God is the foundation. So be careful when you try to pass on what you experienced and you don't have scripture and a good understanding of it. So somebody lays hands on you and you felt something powerful. Don't turn around and just go lay hands on everybody in the congregation because what happened to you, you want to happen to them. That's not how this works. There's no formula. We can't just all stand up and lay hands on each other right now and get all kinds of stuff from the Lord that way. There is a scriptural way. It does happen and it does work, but we're going to do it according to the word of God, not according to what happened to me. I don't expect everybody to act the way I acted when God came on me. And that's a mistake that a lot of Christians make. And that's how we get denominations. Something happened to a group of people. And they brought it over and tried to introduce it to another group of people. And they said, we don't want that. And so they divide from each other. Because they were basing it on experience. Not on the whole counsel of truth. 
So the laying on of hands is powerful in at least two ways. One is the soul realm of laying on of hands. Human touch is so powerful. My wife and I like to hold hands. And it's powerful. I take her by the hand and she takes a deep breath and does her shoulders like this. <laughs> she takes me by the hand and I just melt into a puddle. Oh, feels so good. She likes me. She was thinking about me. Human touch is powerful in the soulish dimension. It's also powerful in the spiritual dimension, which is what we're going to really talk about. But I want to lay a little groundwork here because there was a survey or an uh, experiment done on some orphan children years and years and years ago. And at, at their own expense, I'll mention, but they took 50 orphan children and didn't touch them with their hands just spoke to them. They were kind to them. They didn't treat them any differently. They fed them well. They had a good place to sleep. They were safe. And they took another 50 orphan children in this orphanage, and they made sure that they were touched numerous times a day. That they had, when they talked to them, they would take them by the hand and talk their hand on their hand. Parents, you ought to tr try this with your children. When you're talking to them, take them by the hand. Let them feel your touch. Put your hand on their arm and let them feel you while you're talking to them. In the soulish dimension, human touch has so much power. And after one year of these children, 50 being touched and loved on and 50 not getting any human touch, it was drastic, startling, the difference in the attitudes, in the demeanor. Some of those children went into dark places of depression and, and began to be drawn to other things that were not healthy for them just because of the lack of human touch. Well, oh, my, my family, we don't hug. Then you need to get delivered. I'll help you. I'll help you. I got two arms and a heart. I will fix you. We had a lady come here one time years ago, and she said, I don't hug. I said, you do now. <laughs> I fixed her. I did. I did. After that, she was hugging everybody. She said, hey, this is good. It's like a kid that won't eat spinach. You didn't try it. That's one of my favorite foods now. I go to restaurants just because they have spinach and turnip greens and all that stuff. I love greens. It don't look appealing. Try it. You might like it. We had somebody tried fried okra this week that never tried it. Try touching. You might like it. The laying on of hands ties directly to the such as I have, give I thee. So we always use this principle here. You can't give away what you don't have. But if you have, you need to be giving it away. And you need to be giving it away at a regular clip. And you need to be obedient to the Holy Ghost when he speaks to you and says, go over and touch that person. Amen? And so... When you lay hands on somebody, you're not going to be able to do for them anything other than what the Holy Spirit puts in you to do for them. So if you're not living right, I don't want you laying hands on my kids. I don't want you touching the sheep. Amen? If you're out there flirting with the world and partaking of sin. Don't you be laying hands on anybody. 
You have my personal authority to keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> Amen? I don't want you rubbing no mess off on nobody. Amen? It is very real. Thank you. But when you lay hands on somebody in the Spirit, by the leading of the Holy Spirit and in obedience to the Holy Spirit, there is a transfer of power that is literal and real in the spiritual realm. It's beyond the soulish human touch thing. It's beyond any other kind of thing you can imagine. It goes to another level, and the power of laying on of hands will bring healing, deliverance, strength, encouragement, impartation, fruit of the Spirit can be imparted. Gifts of the Spirit can be imparted by the laying on of hands. And somebody can feel peace that hadn't had any peace. Somebody can experience physical healing that had never experienced physical healing. I've seen so many, many, many thousands and thousands and thousands of people healed Cancers gone, goiters disappeared, growths dissolve, blood vessels open up, strokes reversed by the laying on of hands. Amen. It's not the only way you can get healed because God is sovereign. But it works, as you have heard in this testimony from Mark and Dave going to OSU Hospital and laying hands on the sick and her recovery. You heard it right here. The doctors last night, Vern was like, I don't know, it's just bad, you know. But today, but God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I've got scriptures, but I'm going to give you a little bit more here of just some things that I believe you need to hear from the Lord. When a person lays hands on someone, there is a certain amount of authority being taken. So the person laying hands has authority over the subject that they're laying hands on. So the subject is submitting themselves to that authority of God over their life. God works in order. He doesn't work out of order. So you never lay hands on someone that you're submitted under. A child shouldn't just walk over to their parent and just lay hands on them without permission, without knowing that the parent is okay with that. Does that make sense? Because there's a certain order and there's power that's happening and the you have to submit yourself to what God is about to do through them in your life. And you allow that virtue, that flow of power to come through them to you. And you become subject to the power of God through that authority in, the, in, in your life. Now, sometimes that person is lacking in that submission and sometimes God will just break through your ego or your pride and sometimes somebody will lay hands on you and the Holy Spirit of God will just knock you out and that's a good way to get it get somebody submitted right you know the hospital they say we sedated them so we can do certain things well, sometimes God will sedate you so he can fix you. Because you, if, you, if you weren't sedated, your mind would just block everything God's trying to do. It's okay for God to just take you out, fix you, and then wake you up. Amen? I'm, just, I'm not trying to get real theological. I'm just telling you in simple terms. There's times when God needs to bypass my intellect to do into my spirit what needs to be done. And I'm okay with that. There are many, many levels of authority in, in God's economy, in God's kingdom, in God's government. And you need to find 
the, that level and operate in the level that he's given you to operate in. Don't be trying to be a pastor if God's got you at some other level of authority. If you're not an elder, you don't have authority, governmental authority in the house of God. But you can flow and you can be gifted and you can heal and these signs shall follow them that believe. You don't have to have the authority of an elder for signs to follow you. Amen? But you, you learn this through time and through paying attention and staying submitted to the counsel of God. The scriptures tell us to lay hands suddenly on no one. So when you're zealous, when you're fresh and new and somebody just laid hands on you and you're all charged up and you're like, man, you want to go lay hands on somebody. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Take a deep breath. Pause. Get up beside an elder and say, whoo, something's on me. What do I do? And let an elder walk you through these moments because the Bible tells us do not lay hands suddenly, quickly, in a, in a rush or in an emotional moment on anyone. But wait for the Holy Spirit's leading and wait for accountability and all of those things to take their place. I'll say this, and you can do with it whatever you want to do with it. I'm not trying to cross theology with anybody. I'm not trying to establish any rules or regulations. I'm just saying, from my understanding of the scripture, the only time anybody laid hands on anybody and it was recorded in the Bible, it worked. It worked. So if you're doing a lot of laying on of hands and you're not getting a lot of results, you might want to not lay hands on so much and seek the Lord about how to be in line with the Spirit, in tune with the Holy Ghost, so when you lay hands on somebody, something happens. You don't see me forming these big long lines and just standing up here knocking people over for hours. Now, if the Holy Ghost tells me to, I will. And there's people that do that, and the Holy Ghost probably told them to, and that's fine and good. But I'm not going to do it just because somebody else did it. Is that, you, you hear where I'm coming from? Because I don't see that in the Bible. Nowhere in Scripture was there a long line of people and somebody just laying hands on them. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's a sin. I'm just saying we're going to do what the Bible says, and, th and that's just okay. But don't be shy and limit God because you have never seen it done that way. If the Lord says do it, grab an elder, make sure it's in alignment with the order of the house and do it. Don't be shy because, well, the Apostle Paul never did that or I've never seen pastor do that. Don't be shy. God's getting ready to do some amazing things and you're the ones that's going to be doing it. Okay. So, who laid hands on the sick or laid hands on people in the Bible. Number one, Jesus laid hands on the sick. The disciples laid hands on the sick in the book of Acts, including the Apostle Paul. So if you've got any friends that come from theology that says only the 12 apostles had the power of laying on of hands, I sound like I'm cynical, don't I? That was sarcasm, wasn't it? I apologize. I just want to say they're wrong. Number three, Ananias was not one of the 12 apostles and laid hands on Paul, and he received his sight and the Holy Ghost. Number four, Paul laid hands on Timothy. According to the book of the letter he wrote to Timothy. And number five, 
in your Bible, elders of the church, not the disciples, laid hands on people. Now that's the people, that's how we know in the scriptures, good foundation. The laying on of hands was done in the New Testament church, and not just by the apostles, but it was done as a regular practice, pretty regularly by God's people in the church. So number two, what's the purpose? Now we know who can do it. Let's look at the purpose of doing it. First and foremost, probably the most common in Scripture and the most common among us today is for physical healing. It's very, very common. It's recorded many times in Scripture. I could give you a whole list of Scriptures on that. Another thing that happens with that physical healing is something called virtue. There's a virtue that God places in you when you lay hands on somebody. You literally can feel the virtue go out from you. I've laid hands on a number of people before, and it literally physically drained me. Cindy, you know what I'm talking about. You pray for people, and you weren't shoveling and using a wheelbarrow, but you feel tireder than you would if you'd laid block all day. It's exhausting because when the virtue goes out of you, your, your endorphins and your adrenaline and all these things are working, and it'll just drain, physically drain you. You need a vacation sometimes from what goes forth out of you through the laying on of hands. They laid hands on for the sending, like we did Adrian. We laid our hands on him, like they did in the book of Acts, and we sent him to Indiana, spiritually sending. And God is blessed. God is anointing him. He's preaching around that area. He's preaching in Illinois. They've got believers and followers of their ministry in two states, three states, Missouri. Missouri has a group that they minister to. And then the third thing we'll talk about is impartation. Laying on of hands for the purpose of impartation. So in the soul realm, this happens all the time and people don't even realize it. You hang out with somebody in the world, it's pretty common for there to be illicit relationships that are physical in nature. And you don't realize it, but every one of those relationships and impartation happens between two people. God knew this when he made us, and he made one man for one woman for a reason. So that there wouldn't be all this messed up impartation going on between humans and then passing on stuff that's not from God and it, people who've had multiple partners in their life have a lot of stuff they got to deal with and get rid of because impartation happens through physical touch in the spiritual not, I'm talking about the soulish realm okay in the spiritual realm the laying on of hands can impart spiritual gifts. And that's on purpose, by design. And many times, you know, we'll be fasting and praying before we allow an impartation to happen. I had a man impart something to me many, many, many years ago. And it shook me to the core. It was a powerful spiritual impartation. And it was during a time of intercessory prayer. And he walked up and he was weeping and I was weeping. He's an older man. And he had something in him that God had put in him and worked in him and had come on him through God's power that I needed. And I didn't even know I desired it. But he grabbed me and he gave me a big old bear hug. He didn't lay hands on me like you, know, like you see in pictures or like we do here, he gave me a big old bear hug and just shook me and hugged me and prayed and cried and I prayed and cried. And when he let go of me, I was changed 
by the power of God, I had received an impartation of spiritual things. Moses laid his hands on Joshua and said, I impart to you a spirit of wisdom. And so, <clears throat> as much as we need to get rid of a lot of stuff that's been imparted into us when we come to Jesus, as much as we need the waters of baptism to wash away all the junk that we've lived and has been put on us and all the trauma and all the mess, we need to be open to let God impart to us through the laying on of hands what gifts we need. I have a friend who's one of the top songwriters in this country for worship music. He had never written a song in his life. He wasn't very good at music. He could sing really well. But a pastor, one day he was out on the platform of the church practicing, and the pastor just walked up behind him and put his hands on his head and began to prophesy and imparted to him the gift to write. And he became one of the greatest songwriters through impartation. He didn't study songwriting. He didn't have a songwriter walking along beside him. He didn't go co-write with a bunch of well-known artists. He just God just began to pour some of the most powerful worship songs you've ever seen, and we sing them here all the time through this man of God. Similar thing happened with Hannah, our worship leader. She'd never led a worship song. I don't guess. Not, not really. Did you sing solos before or something? Very few. Sang with her dad. But one Sunday or one uh, evening, Paula just invited her over to the old chapel and said, I turned on the sound and she picked up the mic and started singing and the anointing came on her. She began to weep. Paula said, stop. Kneel down. She knelt at that little altar over there. Paula laid her hands on her, imparted the gift to her, and immediately she joined the praise team and became our worship leader almost overnight. It was like amazing. Praise God. The power of laying on of hands. I know someone that had never played an instrument, and somebody laid hands on them, and they went over and said, go over and play that piano. And they walked over and sat down at the piano and begin to play masterfully by the gift of impartation. I'll take some of that. <laughs> Sign me up. Amen. So real quick, I'll uh, close with some scriptures that will build your faith, and then we're going to uh, pray a little bit. <clears throat> in Mark 6, Jesus was unable to do any great miracle in Nazareth except... To heal a few people by laying his hands on them. So Jesus himself, even when the faith of the community was so dark and the people, nothing, God couldn't do anything through Jesus himself in this community, he laid hands on some people and healed them anyway. That's how powerful the laying on of hands is. In, in Mark 8, 22, they arrived at Bethsaida. Some people brought a sightless man and begged Jesus to give him a healing touch. Taking him by the hand, he led him out of the village. Put spit on the man's eyes, laid his hands on him, and asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see men. They look like trees walking. Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and the man looked hard and realized he had recovered perfect sight. Saw everything in his bright 2020 focus, Jesus sent him straight home telling him, don't enter the village. In Luke 13 and 10, he was in one of the meeting places on the Sabbath. There was a woman present, so twisted and bent over with arthritis, she couldn't even look up. She'd been afflicted with this for 18 years. Everybody say, 18 years. 18. When Jesus saw her, he called her over. Woman, you're free. He laid his hands on her, and suddenly... She was straight and tall, giving glory to God. Now, you can read many, many, many of these scriptures to build your faith and to get you pumped up about laying hands on. You say, well, that was Jesus. 
Well, let me remind you of another little verse that's tucked away in the scriptures, not in there a bunch of times, where he said, and greater things than this shall ye do. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to do greater. Amen. So in Acts chapter 6, you can read where they laid hands on the, some, some people and sent them to do the work of the Lord. In Acts chapter 8, you can read where they laid hands on people and they received the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 9, you can read where the greatest persecutor of Christianity's birth, Saul of Tarsus, went to the house of one named Ananias and he laid hands on him, which was a mighty brave act. But Saul submitted to it. The Lord changed his name to Paul and he became the apostle. And in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5, you can read where Paul laid hands on Timothy and he said, stir up the gift that's in you by the laying on of my hands for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. How many knew that the scripture about not being given a spirit of fear was about laying on of hands? Huh? See, you thought it was about getting a night's sleep or getting your kid to go to their room. And that works, amen? But in the context of the Bible... If you read just a verse above there, you'll realize that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind is about laying on hands. Hello, that is awesome. I didn't know that. Praise God, I know it now. So in 1 Timothy 4... Let no man despise your youth, but be an example of believers in the word. Verse 12. In conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come and give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by the prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself. And to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Look at somebody and say, keep on laying on hands. If you'll do this, you'll save yourself and you'll save your family and you'll save your children. Dads, lay hands on your children. Say, so, oh, that sounds kind of weird. I don't know. It works. If you're as desperate as most parents I talk to, you try about anything. <laughs> Pull up a chair, say, sit down, son. Got something for you. What are you going to do, Dad? I'm going to lay hands on you, pray for you. Make it a habit. You ought to do it so much that when they're feeling a little down or going through something, they just have a habit of grabbing the chair and pulling it up and saying, come here, Dad. I'm ready. Help me out, Dad. Give me something. Bless me. Pray for me. Anoint me. Lay hands on me. That's a beautiful thing. When you had a, that kind of environment in your home, that you don't wait to church when the music's loud and the Emotions are flowing to come and ask for prayer. You just walk into your dad's room and say, Hey, dad, you got a minute? Lay hands on me and pray for me. We're going we're gonna to set a culture. Matthew, you are a leader of a whole cultural shift. We've been doing this long enough. And stuck in our little ruts and walking around with our ego and our pride. And God says, we need to change. We need to do something fresh and new. Errol, you got two 
wonderful young men sitting right there to your right that love Jesus. And everything you have, you got just a few short days to impart to them. Don't let them leave your house without, with, without taking everything you have spiritually. Make sure that you impart it to them. I'm looking in the eyes of some daddies in this room who wish you'd have heard this message 35 years ago. I see it. I sense it. I feel it. Some of you saying, man, I wish I would have done that. I wish I'd have done that to my girls. I wish I'd have done that to my boys. I wish somebody would have preached this message to me. You can start now. JB, someday you'll have children. Everything your daddy has given you, everything your... Betsy's all excited about more grandchildren. <clears throat> but you'll be married, and then you'll have children. I'm going to make that clear here. But everything that your grandparents and your parents have passed into you, you'll impart to them. Stand to your feet. When the woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment, the Bible said he felt virtue go out of him. I want us to get to a place in this house where when we encounter one another in spiritual moments, we sense the virtue go out from us. And we know that we know that we know that we know that person was delivered. That person was healed. See, we... As a, as, a, as a group, Christianity, especially charismatic Pentecostals, we've tried to entertain our way out. We've tried to sing our way out. We've tried to buy our way out. But the healing I'm talking about, we are in a, a land that needs a healing. Paul, there's too many suicides, too many overdoses. And Paul's on the tail end of all of that. He, he's been interceding and God's been delivering and stopping the spirit of death. Just amazing things. He could tell you about it. But where we need to get involved, Paul, is at the other end. When the trauma happens, we need to be the safe place. Where that little 12 year old girl can run and say something happened to me and I need to talk about it we need to get to the place where we allow the virtue that's in us to flow out of us and I, I'm sorry Hannah to use you for another example but it just popped in my mind when she was anointed and flowing out in her ministry today somebody nudged me and said She's been squeezed, and the oil is coming out. Some of you have been through some trauma, and God healed you. Some of you walked out of the dark valley of depression, and you've got something in your hands. Hold, hold up every one of your hands. Everybody hold up both hands wide open. Hey, Matthew, you got some big hands. <laughs> and they're full. Your hands, Matthew... I'm glad I called you out because there's a lot in those hands that God wants to use. You hear me? Keep your hands clean. Porter, God is so all over you, man. You, you have no idea how God's about to use you, young man. Hear me. Hear me. I see so much of me in you. You're right about where I was spiritually at your age. Hear me. Just hear me. At your age, I was right about where you are. I, I was still coming to church. That's about it. 
You hear what I'm saying? But God's all over you today. These hands that are lifted high in this house today, God, I speak in the name of Jesus as the authority of this house, as the apostle given to lead this house. I lead these hands to touch, heal, impart, deliver, set the captives free, bind up the brokenhearted. Lord, use my hands for your glory. Begin to tell him right now. Call on him. Say, God, use these hands. God, I want my hands to be anointed. Let me see your hands real quick. Anoint these hands to play the keys. Uh, anoint these hands to play the guitar. Anoint these hands to play the drums and the bass. Anoint these hands for music. Uh, let him begin to write songs of praise. Uh, songs that declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let him speak to his generation through the tones of the music you put in his soul. In the name of Jesus, there's power to set you free. In the name of Jesus, there's power to set you free. In the name of Jesus, there's glorious victory over sin, disease, and sickness. Power to walk in liberty through faith in His wonderful name. Somebody ought to step out right now and come to the front of this room and just obey the voice of the Lord. Hear the Lord. Say, I want more. I want more. I want my hands to be clean. I want my heart to be pure. I want what you're offering today, Jesus. Come on. That's it. That's it. Over sin, disease, and sickness. Power to walk in liberty through faith. His wonderful name. Yes. In the name of Jesus, there's glorious victory over sin, disease, and sickness. Power to Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It is a wonder. you free. Yes, in the name of Jesus, there's glorious victory 
These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Just repeat after me. I will believe. I will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I will believe. I will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I will believe. I will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That God is no respecter of persons. He wants to pour his power into you. It's not age specific. Who in here is 13? 14. Young man. God wants to use you. Who else is 14? Paula's grandfather, Brother James O. Russell, right there, young man, hear this testimony. He was 13. He'd never preached a sermon. He had only had the Holy Ghost for just a few months. He only had a third grade education. And the lady in the church that he went to had passed away. And they laid her out in the living room as they did in those days for what they called a wake. And his family found out that she had died and they drove to her house and brought him along with them. And he was sitting in the living room and all the adults got up and went into the kitchen to prepare food for people to come over. She'd been dead for quite some time. She was very, very, very sick for a long time prior to finally breathing her last breath and brother Jimmy was sitting on the sofa in that living room where that lady was laid out to rest and the Lord said if you'll go touch her I'll raise her up and he said Am I on candid camera? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. The Lord said it a second time and then a third time. He got up off of the couch. He went over while the adults were in the kitchen. No one was around. In obedience to the Holy Ghost, he laid his hands on the lady. She opened her eyes and she got up. And she went in the kitchen and started cooking because she wasn't even sick anymore. The power of the laying on of hands. These signs shall follow them that believe. He didn't have a doctorate degree. He didn't have a license with a denomination. He didn't lead a church congregation. He never preached a sermon. But he raised the dead. It's going to happen, Michael. We're not giving up. You know what the Lord said to you. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, open blind eyes, unstop deaf ears in Jesus' name by the power of the laying on of hands. This is our time. The Word of God said it. 
I choose to believe it, and I will walk in out. I will walk in faith. I will trust and obey what the Lord has told me to do, and we will see the victory, the deliverance, and the power of God in our day in Jesus' mighty name. Go ahead and praise him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Yes! Glory to God. Amen. Wednesday night is our first Wednesday prayer, and that one is a whole lot of fun because it goes a little bit longer than an hour. We have a little extra praise and worship, a little bit longer exhortation, and a whole lot of time to pray and preach and pray and prophesy, and there will be some snacks. I don't know about you, but... Uh, if you want to get me in the crowd, just throw out some chips. And... Isn't that right, Ginger? I declare freedom for freedom. my daughter. Woo! Declare it. Freedom I love you. I Thank you. Thank you. No matter what your word has spoken, say it. No matter what I, I see or what I feel, I declare oh. every chain is broken. They're going to be free. Our offering boxes so I... are by the door. Mark your envelope for Indiana campus.